I'm in the process of making a couple of new paddles and always make them out of hardwood, but this is the first time I've used striped maple. Some call it tiger maple. It's a very popular wood in the 16, 1700s for making musket stocks from. It's absolutely beautiful. And this has got a stripe about every quarter inch. So it's gonna make a stunning paddle. So a lot of, a lot of hand work. Uh, essentially I take the square I've made here and I'm gonna take the corners off. So I'm gonna take four sides and make it eight. Then I'm gonna take eight sides and make it 16. And then I'm gonna work it out till it's round. I kind of like a bit of an oval shaft um, in, in the same plane as the paddle versus completely round. It just feels better in my hand. Anyway, I've got to, I've got to get back at my garden. Um, we think of summertime as the time of holidays and our downtime and going to the cottage in our modern world. But in the 17 and 1800s, um, it was it was the work season. It was when you had to get the food in the ground. You had to do foraging, hunting. Uh, you had to cut firewood, uh, tend livestock, hunt. Um, so extremely busy time. And the downtime was actually in the winter. So once one had the uh, woodshed full and lots of meat harvested and your root cellar was full of all your hard efforts in the summertime, that's the time you took your holidays. So you'd put your feet up, play your fiddle, uh, read, tell stories. Um, anyway, I'm gonna have to put this on hold for a bit and get back at my garden. But I also in the background, you see, I've got a number of cedar logs out, so they don't know it yet, but they're gonna be a canoe. Uh, the shorter bolts here will be ribs. I'm hoping to build about a 16 to a 17 foot canoe. So uh, in, in which case I need somewhere around 38 to 40 ribs. So I'll actually make mm, probably close to 50 because when I get to the steaming part of the ribs, I often break a few if there's any um, faults in the wood at, at, the, at the bending point. So I'll make about 10 extra. Uh, and the longer logs behind me, they're, um, they'll be for the sheathing, which I'll, I'll draw a knife out down to almost paper thin thickness. So th this is another typical day in a homestead in the 1700s. Too many things to do and not enough hours in the day. So yeah, before I ever get at that canoe, I've got a few priorities. Um, uh, yesterday I forged out a new hanger for a lantern, a stamped tin lantern that I want to hang by the door in the cabin and a few other little things to do back there. And um, yeah, when I get all that done, um, then I definitely have to get at working at my food production. So the interesting thing about uh, stamped tin lanterns in the 1700s, um, it was called white smithing as opposed to blacksmithing. So they worked with um, they work with hot white metal versus a blacksmith working with iron. Uh, we now call them tinsmiths. And the stamped lantern actually dates back to about the 14th century, I think. Wouldn't want to be quoted on that, but it became hugely popular in the 1700s. 
A lot of people thought that they stamped them with a certain pattern for a family. So if they walked around the village at night, they would know friend from foe. But uh, that is a myth. It circulates at reenactments and living history events and such. But total myth. What it was, in fact, wasn't really a lantern at all. Although with the, with the little door open, it would cast some light. But essentially, it was a candle carrier. So if we're thinking of an era before matches, and they weren't invented, I believe, uh, 1858 somewhere around that time period. For, so basically just before the American Civil War. Um, basically this was to go out at night and you could carry a lantern in it and the wind wouldn't blow it out. So um, you had to go to the barn to tend an animal giving birth or do the chores in the winter. This was the way you'd carry fire to the barn to light lanterns um, that had basically glass about them. But it does, uh, it gives a crazy neat ambiance to the inside of a cabin with the stamped in it. You get these little freckles of light all over the log walls. Anyway, that will light the way into the door and be readily available if I have to go off out and need fire. I've um, whittled a couple of hangers and I'll whittle a couple more because I got lots of paddles I've made for storing my paddles. And these are some I made of the cherry. Um, uh, same as the blocks I made here, they're cherry left the bark on, sort of a rustic look. But limited space in the cabin, so try to take advantage of all that uh, by storing them in. And as you saw earlier, I'm working on a couple of curly maple ones I think are gonna be absolutely stellar. So yeah, when they're done, I'll hang them on the other side. Anyway, Luke's been here for a couple hours. He's been working on the fireplace and I'm gonna go in and see how he's progressing. What do you think, Luke, about masonry today versus, uh, say, masonry two or three hundred years ago? Well, we've got a lot of a lot of technology today that helps us a lot. It's still very hard work and probably one of the most hands-on trades, but it's nothing like they did it two hundred years ago. Uh, build these stone buildings in, like, the Kingston, Ontario area. Perfect hand-chiseled columns. Uh, we have machines that make that stuff today that I work with, and and they're not anywhere near that that accurate that they were back then with uh, none of this machining or precision. They just chiseled them all by hand and they were perfect, square, true, straight. You couldn't, unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable, really. Big structures too. Imagine yeah. hauling all that stone in there with horse and buggy. No, not even like today. We have forklifts to lift those up and they had horses and pulleys and built their own scaffold out of, out of new uh, tube and clamp and stuff like that. It, uh, really unreal, really something to, to fathom. Does give one or... Uh, Pretty amazing respect for, for our sure. ancestors. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this is coming along. Good. It's yeah. Really good. Yeah, it's starting to look nice. Have the fire rolling before winter. There you go. 
you and Chris go over for a dinner back today, yep. I'll tell you. Yeah, we will take our our hand tools. We just try and get them as nice and straight as possible. Then we'll join them up nice afterwards. So when you're not stacking them, Luke, you call them soldiers. Yeah, right? standing them up is a soldier push. Yep, vertically. This cabin's getting close to be sealed in. The only light really coming in here now is that opening, and that's soon to disappear. Yeah. We also got the mantle finished, and uh, out of a chunk of walnut, same tree I made that cavern sign out of. And I uh, got it all finished up there. We're hopefully we're going to get that in place today. There's a soldier roll. Nice. Very nice. So as you can see, Luke's done an absolutely outstanding job with the brickwork and the fireplace. Um, all we have to do is put the mantle on and I've got that finished. Uh, we're letting this set up a little bit. And uh, this pretty little girl, and it's on my lap here, she's an English uh, Cocker Spaniel, bird dog, flushing dog. So in the 1700s, they simply wouldn't have had, um, uh, they wouldn't have had a dog that wasn't useful. So hounds would probably have been the most common, but yeah, bird dogs, retrievers, pointers. Uh, some of the older breeds they would have had, but they had to have a purpose. And this young lady is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to dog say, a good friend of mine, um, good friends of mine, I should say, I just had a grandson born yesterday, and they're gone for a couple weeks to visit their daughter and, and stay with the grandson. Yeah. And this pretty little girl, she's going to stay with me for, I got her for 15 more days. Right? She's a pretty girl. Yeah. She's a pretty girl. And I'm not going to need to wash my ears. <laughs>